Listen, alcohol is just out in 2024. There is a rising trend of going alcohol-free or being sober curious, and alcohol, the truth is, it's just bad for you and can famously impair your sex life. So if you're looking for another way to unwind, relax, or just have fun, I cannot recommend Vaya's THC gummies enough. Vaya has gummies for every occasion. Whether it's to improve your sleep, I love their sleep gummies, I take them everywhere, your mood or your focus. They even have an aphrodisiac gummy called High Love to boost my arousal levels. High Love has a unique blend of cannabinoids and aphrodisiac exotic herbs that are known for their libido enhancing effects. So I've been using Vaya for a while now and I absolutely love love them. They're a super trusted company. They use premium hemp, natural ingredients, and they're known for their premium indoor THCA flower. All their products are made here in the U.S. They got quick and discreet shipping to all 50 states so you can all enjoy them, not to worry, and also super affordable. So head over to viahemp.com and use code EMILY at checkout to save 15% off your order. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Use code EMILY at checkout for 15% off your order and let me know what you think. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Sex with Emily podcast. So excited for today's show. I've got Dr. Hernando Chavez. He's a sex therapist and sex professor. And Dr. Ava Goodell is the new Penthouse Magazine sex columnist. So thanks everyone for listening to Sex with Emily. You're going to love the show. But first, a shout out to one of my sponsors. As you know, we've all got hair in places we don't want them. And we spend so much time and money, razors, waxing, trying to get rid of all that hair. And it's such a pain in the ass and you spend so much money. The best way to remove unwanted hair with zero pain is the No-No Pro. It's actually, you know that I love electronic objects. Usually I'm talking about vibrators. This is actually a hair removal device. And I almost like it better than some of my vibrators. You can do it at home when you're sitting there. It's for men and for women. You can remove that hair on your face, your hair, your back. You know, guys, you might got some hair in places you don't want it. And you never know what to do. This is what you do. you got to get the No-No Pro. It comes with a 100% 60-day money-back guarantee. And when you purchase it, you get a $50 gift card and an award-winning skincare line. Go to nonoemily.com. That's nonoemily.com. Look into his eyes. They're the eyes of a man obsessed by sex. Eyes that mock our sacred institutions. Bedroom eyes, they call them in a bygone day. Hey, Emily. You got a boyfriend? Because uh, my man E here, he just got his heart broken. He thinks you're kind of cute. A girl's got to have her standards. Oh, my. The women know about shrinkage. Isn't it common knowledge? What do you mean, like laundry? It shrinks? Can we not talk about sex so much? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God, I feel so good. Being bad feels pretty good. You know, Emily's not the kind of girl you just play with. You're listening to Sex with Emily. We're talking about sex relationships and everything in between. For more information, go to sexwithemily.com where you can... You can do a lot of things inside the Emmy.com. First thing you should do is sign up for my mailing list because um, I, I don't want to brag, but I give good email. I've been told. You get an email like once a week from me, and I'm giving you information that will help you improve your sex life and your relationship. And it's not spammy or weird, and I won't tell your name. And also my podcast. Easily subscribe to them on iTunes. I've got hundreds of them up there, the thousands that I'll be posted that are uh, coming up soon. Thousands in the vault that will be real soon. Also, um, yeah, if you subscribe, you never miss a Sex with Emily show again because we've got two a week. So thanks, everyone, for joining me today. And I'm really excited because I'm actually, I'm not at the Loveline studio. I am at the Catalyst Con conference, which is in Los Angeles. And Catalyst Con is a conference created to inspire exceptional conversations about sexuality. I'm excited because I don't even have to talk during the show because I've got some amazing experts here. I mean, you know I will talk. I can't help it. But I love my guests today because they really are going to bring up some topics that we haven't talked a lot about lately, and they are total pros. And this conference, actually, is uh, their mission is to reach out, stimulate attendees to create important conversations within communities and change discourse, acceptance of sexuality within society. So this is going to be an amazing weekend, and I chose two people that I really, really want to talk to for a while that happen to be here, and I'm so glad. And my first guest is Dr. Hernando Chavez. Hernando. Welcome to the Sex with Emily show at long last. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, and I'm happy we finally got a chance to get together and uh, talk about sex. I, really? I mean, it's just been so long. That, that, like, we've been talking, whatever. I'm so impressed by you and everything you've done. And I love that you are an actual sex therapist, clinical, that you see patients, you help a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And I always talk about, you know, a lot of times I hear from my listeners and, you know, I say, well, maybe you guys should go some sex counseling or seek sex therapist. But, but it's been a while since I've actually had someone on the show that can explain what exactly it is. Like, wh wh who are your clients? 
for example. You know, sex therapy is different from traditional therapy because we do have a specialization and we work specifically with sexual concerns, kink, erotica, uh, erotic minorities. Um, what we do in sex therapy is essentially focus on, on what your sexual concerns are, and typically you'll find that there are other adjacent issues going on, depression, anxiety, and such. So you still have the training of being a therapist to work with these mood disorders and other you know, uh, 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 mental health difficulties, but then you've also got this comfort and knowledge with, with, uh, with their um, specific lifestyle or sexual minority you know, uh, uh, experiences. So it's a really wonderful way for people to work on these things that oftentimes in society we don't talk about. You know, no. Who talks to their doctor about Nobody does. Sex? Nobody does. I mean, it's amazing to me how, you know, how many emails I get and when I do Love Line every week and people are calling with these, you know, deeply, deeply personal, scary questions they have. And, and, and we're always like, you know, Dr. Andrea, can you talk to your doctor? Oh, no, I can't talk to my doctor. I can't talk to anybody. People just don't know how to talk about sex and know who to go to. Yeah, and, and we, don't have a, you. we don't have a space in the society for us to find a professional um, you know, there was a research study that, that, uh, t that uh, talked to about 300 plus different uh, medical schools and asked how much sexuality education do you have in your med school programs, and on average it was 11 hours total. Right, out of their like gazillion hours and, and 10 and years of practice. Of course, right? and half of it was anatomy and sort of the medical aspects, so they really don't get much sexological information about pleasure or about uh, you know, concerns. Typically, you'll find that if a doctor hears a sexual concern, they're going to search in their bag of medications to try to fix it. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. And it's so interesting because I went to see a therapist once, and it was with a boyfriend of mine. And we went. It was just a regular therapist. She was a couples therapist. And she said to me, and we were ha actually at the time, there was a lot of issues, but of course, I can't. We were having some sexual issues as well. She says, you know what, Emily? In my 30 years of doing this as a, sex ther as a, as a couples therapist, I've never had one couple, not one couple in here that did not have some issue or some problem in their relationship relating to sex. And I just found that so interesting that, you know, and sometimes people are in therapy for so long and they don't even, they don't even talk about it. They don't even bring it up with their regular therapist because they, they don't talk about it with each other. And it's not until, and I think for the therapist to even bring it out in them. Like I remember I had a close family member who was in therapy for a long time, you know, with his wife. And, and I said, well, did you guys like, what about sex? Oh, no, we couldn't talk about that. I'm like, well, that's the main thing because you haven't had sex in 10 years, you know, but people, they just, it's like a disconnect because so many other things have gone on in the relationship and they're not thinking of that it's the sex when a lot of times the culprit is the sex and all these other things. I almost think it's the basis for a lot of issues right. in relationships. And, and you hit a bullseye, which is communication. So many couples let sex be the elephant in the room. They avoid, they skirt around these issues. They try you know, other ways to try to fix things, but it's really more about getting things out on the table and talking about them together. You know, there's so much permission giving, there's so much comfort and empathy we can get from having these communicative conversations with our partners about sex, and if we avoid them, often it brings up anxieties within us, we start feeling inferior, insecure, and all of a sudden these are recipes for, you know, uh, not having a very fun sex life. Right. I mean, I've been thinking, it's so true, because I, I always say that it's weird, like couples, you know, they could they eventually, they, you know, develop intimacy and they can talk about anything, but it's the sex. They just can't break that barrier. And I often think they get into relationships and the sex amazing. What's there to talk about? You know, we're having the best right. sex really. We're going to marry a long life together. And then a year and a half goes by, maybe if you're lucky, two years. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, we can't really talk about it. So I always think, of how can we get couples to start talking at the beginning? How can we get them to develop this so, so it's not the elephant in the room, so it's part of their conversation when they're talking about money and bills and work and balance, they're also prioritizing their sex life. You know, one of the things we don't do well in this culture is talking about sex early on in our, in our childhoods and in our teen years. Because we avoid those subjects, uh, to speak about them on a more intellectual or educational level, you know, a lot of, obviously a lot of kids and teens are talking about it like playfully in, in their own sort of peer experiences. But uh, they're not getting the, the information and so that they can have these conversations as adults because, you know, talking about your sex life, talking about pleasure, talking about the concerns you have, it's a mature conversation. And, and we're not given those skills to have. We're not even primed for it. Not even primed for it. But you're also, I want to say, first of all, Dr. Hernando Chavez, that is your website, correct? Yes. Okay, so, and this will all be on sexwithemily.com so they can find out more about you there. But you also teach. Can you talk about you teach at a, a university? So you're talking to, to kids, and you are giving them the education that they need. Trying get. to, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like one, one child at a time. But uh, I, I teach at a community college. It's the largest CC in the nation. Uh, it's called Orange Coast College, and I teach a Human Sexuality 1 class and a uh, Human Sexuality 2 class, which uh, 
Uh, essentially, the first one is about information giving, PowerPoint speakers, and the second class is about getting in groups and processing our own sexual lives, our histories, you know, uh, you know, talking about things like fantasies or masturbation or social taboos. But start from the beginning, like day one of the class. Day one. Your day kids are how old? They're like between 18 and they're all, they're Usually they're right undergrad. out of high school. It's about 18 to 22, although we have occasional uh, people that are in their 40s and 50s seeking out some information as well, which I love. Um, first day, go over the syllabus. I want them to know what's coming up. You will see sexual information, pictures of sexuality, pictures of movies, videos on sexuality. We're going to see this, 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 and that. And I want them to be able to sign a form and say, I know what I'm getting into. Right, they're not going to see you or go home. Well, it's not about suing. Okay. It's just about... But they need to understand. Like, like I always say to people, consent. right, so you yeah. will work for me. I'm like, if you want to work for me, are you okay? Like, I'm interviewing interns. I'm like, are you okay with sexual materials? Because yeah. that's what we do here. Um, so the kid, they come in, and I would say, I mean, if it were me at the time and I was coming in at 18, I'd have to say that my last sex education was, like, in seventh grade, and they talked. The last thing I, all, the only thing I remember is someone asked if you could have sex underwater. I think he said fuck underwater right. in seventh grade. Um, but that was it. That's all I, I really had any. So I think a lot of these kids are probably coming in starving for the information. Starving for info. I mean, this past Friday uh, in class, you know, a, a girl raised her hand and said, I have a question, but I think it's stupid. And I said, there is no such right, thing as a stupid right. question. Um, you know, let's talk about it. And she said, can a, can a person get pregnant from pre -cum? And it's one of those classic questions right. that uh, even if, if you and I may have heard this question, you know, over and over again, it's something that every generation is coming up. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why haven't we been able to give this information that's so basic? Um, can pre -cum get you pregnant? Well, Cowper's fluid itself is not you know, with sperm. However, there are leftover sperm from previous ejaculations inside of the urethral tract that Cowper's fluid, the pre -cum, can actually pick up and sort of you know, expel out into the vagina. So the answer is yes. It depends on how you look at it. Right. pre -cum can get you pregnant because it can pick up leftover sperm inside the penis, but the Cowper's fluid itself is not filled with uh, sperm itself. It's right, okay. So it can. It just can, like, yeah. Right. But it's not, so that's, so, okay, so what are some other typical questions, like the first questions you think that you get asked by, like, the student? I just find this fascinating because I know that they've probably never been in a forum with someone like you that's comfortable, makes them comfortable. It's disarming. I'm sure you're a very relatable professor and you can sit and talk to them, but I, you know, what comes up? You know, it's funny because I, I come to class in flip-flops and board shorts. I love it. I See, that's what like, they want. They I, don't want. I, I do want to dress like them so I can be more approachable. Absolutely. You know, maybe here Smart. at a conference I'm in a tie, but for them, I know. Look at you. You look amazing. Our, my, my next has kind of Dr. Ava Cadell, actually. Mm -hmm. She dressed you today. Okay. Not in that way. <laughs> uh, I don't know for sure, but she, she gives me a lot of advice and a lot of direction, and one of them is uh, on how to be a, a, a man, a, a better <laughs> sex. <sexist. laughs> well, yeah, that's great. funny too that you said that because I think that if men were a little more open to just suggestion and just a bit of influence uh, yeah. from from let's say women or friends or partners, family, um, I think we could do a lot better and know we can really improve on things like relationships and sex and so on. So. Well, we all have so many insecurities. I think a lot of times when men and women get feedback or help, they just automatically, right. they can't hear it anymore because if something's wrong with them and it's already, you know, affecting their own self-esteem issues they may have already had. It's really interesting, like, perfect timing that you brought up insecurities and also self-esteem because that's one of the main foundations and fuels for a lot of these student questions that I'm getting in college. Uh, what what I oftentimes I see is that the more technical questions they'll ask in class, and then when it's more personal, they wait till after class. You and must then, have a long line after class. You never I, get home. I'll actually say, who has a quick question or who has a question about the class, you know, something about an assignment, and then I'll weed out those questions first, answer them, and then there's usually four or five kids every week that have a question about themselves. I ask them, you know, one person at a time, let's, uh, I want a little privacy, let's go to a different, different side of the room, and you typically get questions like, uh, I'm a guy and I'm only 20 years old and I can't get an erection. What's going on? Or I'm a woman and I can't get never an had an erection. Uh, okay, so let's start with that. What do you say to them? Well, I just start asking. Any meds? Are you taking drugs? Some something? of the classic questions that we would ask, um, but a lot of times I find that it's about performance anxiety. They're scared shitless about being sexual. And where do the, I mean, where do you get these insecurities? And, and when you start think, asking questions about where they come from. It's about not having good sex ed. It's about having some previous experiences that created anxiety within them. It's about watching porn and saying, oh, my God, I've got to have a 12-inch cock. And right. mine is half that size. What's going on here? And when and when they start getting the information uh, that maybe that 6-inch penis or 5-inch penis is actually the average, and that's what most men have. You know, um, they have, like, penis dysmorphia on now. I feel I really believe it to be, like, in the DSM VR now. Because I, you know, I feel like men, the porn has made women, uh, women insecure – Men are like, you know, I know guys, I have personal friends that I've seen their penises or maybe been, you know, a little more active with their penises, and they're like... It's a friendly show. They're like, it's a, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but I'm not naming names. But I'm like, your penis is fine. They're like, no, I don't think it is. I, it's not, I'm like, you, it's 
totally fine. You're right. Please, everybody. But quarantine guys think they have to have like, uh, you know, like we were saying, like Coke bottles, right? right that this right. would be like a Coke can. Yeah. I mean, and, and they're like, they, then they feel like, yeah, they can't perform and what they're seeing. And obviously, it's porn. While it might be very entertaining for them in a release, not technically where they should be learning right, how to right. have sex and how to engage you with know, a woman and please a woman. Exactly. Them, and, way. and watching, you know, porn, which I think is an incredible experience. I think porn can teach us a lot about, you know, adventures and fantasies and, and you know, sexual prowess. And I think it can be wonderful. But if we can also approach it in a way that, uh, you know, we look at this as fun and fantasy rather than reality. Because these are the, you know, in regards to penis size, uh, you know, if, if, if men are trying to compare themselves to that uh, paradigm that they're seeing on the video, they're setting themselves up for failure. You know, they don't realize that there are 15-hour-a-day shoots and there's editing right. and there's all these, you know, prep that goes into anal sex and so right. on. And they think that you just kind of stick it in there and it's supposed yeah. to all Yeah, can we talk about anal sex? I'm glad you brought that up. Sure. Okay. Because this is my big issue with anal sex, that I think that so many women, and I'm just going to say like heterosexual couples, because this is what I hear from a lot, that they... A, they're like, I'm, a, I'm out, and I'm never doing anal again, because they have a lot of really bad first-time experiences where they, they, no one's prepped, literally, no lube, guy puts it in, they're drunk, maybe they're at a party, and, and they're terrified, and it hurts, and it's painful, and I think that, that so many women have had just bad experiences. I'm like, well, don't write it off completely. And then, you know, I try to educate you know, people a lot about prepping for anal sex and about how to take it slow. Obviously, never be forced into it. But just because if you had a bad experience with something, I mean, do, do you get that from a lot of kids? You get a lot a of lot, anal sex questions. A lot, because you see a lot of anal sex in, in videos. They want to try. Right, they're like, oh, I just got a boom, go in and stop. She's gonna love it. She's gonna it's love it. party. Lube. There's no lube. On, they're not showing the lube in the porn set. So exactly. Do you get a lot of questions? A lot, about of, a lot of questions. They want to do it so quickly that I'll, I'll tell them, Look, slow down. I want you to spend maybe four or five, you know, times with your partner where you do nothing but just touch the butt on the outside. Right. Don't even go inside. And you make that promise to them that that nothing's going in. You can touch the outside of their anus, touch their butt, you know, massage them, um, but really make it so that they can reduce their anxiety because when right. you think of the anus, the anus itself has an internal and an external sphincter. The external sphincter, we can all pucker and squeeze and, and you know, have fun with, but the internal one, we cannot control. It's, it's controlled by our brain and the autonomic nervous system, so it's controlled by anxiety reduction, by breathing, by feeling comfortable. Relax. you got to relax. So I, tell people, I tell the same thing. I'm like, spend a week just touching, little lube, or I see if she's even open to it. And don't even put a finger in yet. Take you know, the time. A lot of women also, you know, because they're feeling like, why is this only one way? Why am I receiving it? Let's talk about the that. The guys also have to be a little, uh, uh, I guess, in, embracing of the fact that she might say, well, if you're, if I'm going to do it, then I want you to do it too as well. You know, kind of doing this together in a more kind of qualitative so, way. So penetrate your man is what you're saying. Or at least touch him on the outside. At least kind of go outside. together see, at the same. See if he's down with it as well. So what do you think? Do you hear college students, do you guys come to me and say, I'm kind of curious about it? Do you hear that a lot? Or is it... Yeah, because you know, obviously the stigma. A lot of men believe that it means that they're gay, or it means that you know that that they just don't ever like it. That's not that you know it's for exiting only. You know, whatever yeah, well, they say. When I talk to people about like this and idea, it's prostate that, month. So if you're talking about I'm male, male, male anal play, ones, yeah, you know what does gay mean? And you have to, you have to start breaking it down. You know, is gay uh, behavioral? Does it mean that? Because you know, if you think about gay like behaviors, more gay men kiss than have anal sex. So right. is kissing means I'm gay. What if I'm kissing a woman? Does that make me homosexual? When you start breaking it down, like more gay men like oral sex than they do anal sex, so uh, or penetrative anal right. sex. So. I'm just saying, like, there's stereotypes of why but men wouldn't want to explore this area that could be very right. enjoyable for them. Well, a lot of it is about stigma. It's about masculinity. A lot of it is about uh, uh, fear as well, too. You know, guys are scared. There's a lot of anxieties and, and uh, uh, fears and insecurities that men possess, yet we mask with this, this uh, masculinity and this idea that we have to know things and be sex experts and not show, let them ever see a sweat. Right. And the truth is, I, I believe men are just as fragile as women because yeah. we're human. And if we look at ourselves from that umbrella of, of a humanistic perspective, we're all scared. We're all kind of coming into sex with uh, a, a desire to please ourselves, our partners. And it's so true. And that's the thing I, I learned when I started the show like 10 years ago. I thought, you know, I didn't realize when I was, you know, in college, 18, 19, I didn't realize how terrified men were about sex and even about approaching women and talking to women. I just assumed, because the way we were brought up, socialized, is that guys are going to know. Guys are going to deliver me the orgasm. They're going to take care of me. They're going to know. And I think a lot of women get disappointed because they're with partners who aren't pleasing them or that. We just we give it all to you. And that, that, that's a lot of anxiety because if you've never had sex before and you're only with a few partners, a lot of pressure on the men 
And we really should be starting to communicate with each other, even at a young age, in your first sexual experience is talking about what you like and learning each other's bodies. But I, my, my hat goes off to men. I didn't realize, and no one's telling me that they're all freaking out as much well, as I might be well, freaking out. They even don't know. outside the bedroom, they're freaking out. I yeah. mean, imagine, let's say, uh, there's probably a thousand men who come onto you and, and hit on you. But of those men, they probably were building themselves up. They were trying to fight right. their fears. They were scared. They didn't want to be rejected. They come up to you, and you know whatever happens with that interaction, they're fumbling around in their minds. They're, they're, they're sweaty and so on. And so there's a lot of anxiety that, that we don't express um, because there is a, a perception that confidence is what a man should be. Exactly. And if we're expressive and honest about the fact that, hey, I don't feel so confident about something, that might deter, let's say, a woman from right. Liking us or, or getting together with us, or even in the bedroom, we have to kind of pretend or fake it so that we're confident in order to hide and mask some of those, those fears. Right. And, and, and the thing is also is that the men, not only that, the, the thousands of men maybe have come on to me, or 10, 20 um, in my life, that, that <laughs> what I never realized either was that, and again, this is when I, that there's, that the men that I probably dated, because I never approached men or asked them out, that wasn't like my thing, which I'm, gonna, I'm working on, it's one of my goals. I always thought, I don't know, I just, I'm busy too. It's, I'm like, oh, you like me? Okay, let's go out. It's an incredible but, compliment if you ask out a guy. I know. I really that's the thing. It. I've been trying, I just got interviewed by Women's Health last week, a long article about women making the first move and asking men. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely they should. And, and I, I never, you know, especially in college, I didn't do that. But what I also didn't realize was that there's these legions of men in the corner shuddering and not approaching me. They're probably really, really nice guys. But the only guys that women probably date a lot, if they're not asking guys out, are the ones that have that confidence or that. Mm-hmm. Fake, whatever the barato is to come up to us and ask, oh, but all these really nice guys that we could have dated that just didn't, don't know how to talk and approach women. I mean, I hear from them every day, getting calls from them, and you know, so we, we don't, we just don't know that. We don't know that we're all suffering through the same thing. We're right, all right. We're all just thinking, you know, sex is, getting, sex in our twenties can be such a bummer looking back at it, which is why I try to educate people now about masturbation, which I'm sure you talk about a lot in your class as mm-hmm. well. I mean, to get questions from... A lot of questions. A lot of misinformation out there. If I right. masturbate too much, will it make me go limp and, and not get an erection Let's later? Let's talk about some of those myths. That's important. Like, yeah. that, what do what the students come in with believing? Well, in the, in the old days, we had myths about uh, if I masturbate, will that cause insanity? Will that make hairy palms? Will I go blind? I mean, there's a lot of uh, masturbation myths that we've had for centuries. You don't go blind? Uh, you don't go cool. blind? No. Okay. <laughs> so glad to hear that. But, you know, today... But lately, my, my vision's been a little fuzzy, so a little I'm fuzzy? a little anxious about yeah. it. Yeah. No. How's, how's the wrist, the carpal tunnel? <laughs> that's the pro- that's your problem for life. You know, I have 300 vibrators in my house. Jesus, I'm busy. But, but so, so yeah, so masturbation myths. Uh, you know, for a lot of women, uh, some of the myths that will come up is that it's dirty and that they don't want to get to know their vulva. You know, that's one of the assignments I have them do uh, for extra credit is to do a general exam, to look at your vulva, to look at your lips, to look at your clitoris, get to know your body, get to know your scent. You know, I encourage them to do things like, uh, uh, you know, get know the baseline of your body so that if anything changes, you know that you can seek out some, some medical attention. Right. But also, it's about pleasure and sexual comfort, you know. Um, with masturbation, I find that a lot of women aren't aware that, especially in, in, in the college age group, that you know most women orgasm from clitoral stimulation. So they're not even touching their clitorises; right. they're fingering or they're having penetration, you know, with a, with a dildo or intercourse, and they're not realizing that there's this beautiful love button that can help you reach amazing, you know, heights of pleasure and ecstasy that they're avoiding or missing out on. Absolutely. So I would think that. I mean, I wish someone had told me. I didn't know about it either. Like in college, I really it never occurred to me to masturbate until I even got to college and I was having sex and I remember talking about orgasms. I'm like, what? You did what? You know, I, so I'm sure you get a lot of, of women too who are like, maybe they come in frustrated because they've never had an orgasm. Mm-hmm. And then the first sign is, please meet your clitoris. Right, come right. Come back next week and tell me how it goes. Sometimes a mirror can be your best friend when it comes right. to sex therapy and just Funny, they, just don't, they don't know. And then that, and that during penetration, so a lot of women don't have orgasms that way. Yeah. And for a lot of people, too, I'll encourage them to journal. And this can be in class or in sex therapy, but I do have them write a weekly journal that they write about, um, and, and they turn it at the end of the semester. In therapy, I'll do homework assignments about processing some of your fears. I don't think we do enough of that. We don't look at ourselves and say, what am I doing that, that is either creating obstacles in my life? What are the fears that I'm perpetuating? What are What's fueling some of the fears and anxieties? And we don't look at that. Right, so what comes up, you think, for a lot of them, just about that they're not going to perform, they're going to be rejected? A lot of it comes down to, I'm afraid they're not going to like me. And I'm going to do everything and anything I can to try to make them like me, even if it doesn't feel authentic or real. And if it's a, a, a mask that we put on, we're just hoping that they're going to be together. Because think about inherently what humans want. They want to feel attachment and connection and love and security and safety. These are things that we have not yet had the ability to have a real conversation to tell a partner and say, I'm scared and you make me feel more safe. Right. 
right? So what about your, your, your sex therapy clients? So what would you say is your typical client if, if there is? Typical client? I usually have a 50-50 split. Uh, most often, I'll uh, have 50% of my clients are either uh, uh, sexual concerns, erection difficulties. Uh, a lot of men, right? Lot of and you also people. write for Ask Men. We've got to mention that. Mm-hmm. You've been a writer for Ask Men, which I'm sure everyone knows Ask Men is. You've been writing there for, for years, right? Yeah, for years, about four. Okay. And, um, and your articles are wonderful and popular. So men are coming in with the same erection, erectile dysfunction, penis... A lot of uh, early ejaculation, a lot of uh, p- penis size difficulties. You know, I, I was reading this penis uh, size article, and it was so amazing that, that uh, most men have, you know, if you look at the bell curve, about uh, 80% of men have, like, within the average range, you know, plus or minus an inch. So about five and a half inches is the average. Uh, and then there's 15% of men who have a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. And then when we looked at the satisfaction rates, men, only about 40% of men were, sat- were uh, satisfied with the size of their penis. And then when you asked women, about 85% were satisfied. This is the thing. So, we're, we're not bummed out about it, so why are all these guys freaking out? We're fine. And, and the, most, more, you know? the more we talk about it, the more we realize, you know, a vaginal canal in its in its aroused state is going to be about four to seven inches. Right. Uh, an erect penis, typically around five and a half to six inches, you know. So we're talking like this is like a, a, the nature's way of putting two things together that work very well. When it's an 11-inch penis, believe me, it's not always, you know, pleasurable. Right. It can be exactly. Painful. No, I hear from those people all the time, and guys like, man, they're so lucky. I'm like, no, you don't understand. It's like the grass is always greener or longer on the other side. And you think, um, <laughs> you think, you know, it's like, no, there's pain. And I have women, you know, got men calling, like, I can't have sex with anyone because my penis is like a Coke can, you know, like a 10-inch Coke can. So, yeah, they're all issues. So what are some of, so tell me about, like, like a client that's come to you and then, like, they've left. Like, tell me about some of, like, like a story, like a, what someone's overcome by coming to see you, for example, or how, how the process went down. Well, I'll talk about a client that I have now, which I think might relate to some of your listeners. Um, he's, uh, he struggled with pr- premature ejaculation. He came to me and, uh, uh. 22 quickly. years old, 22 years Showed old, quickly. showed up quickly, he would come quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, come and, and so we tried something different because a lot of times in therapy, it's talk therapy. I, obviously, I have a license. I'm not able to, to do anything. You know, there's no touch in my session. That's so, the thing I wanted to clarify, too. So there, it's not like people are like, oh, is he a surrogate? Does he sleep with you? Well, no, no, that's a whole different thing. You're not right, touching right. him. It's all, it's all talk. There's boundaries. But in this with this client, um, he wanted, rather than just to do a little start, stop, and the masturbation exercise and the breathing exercise that we would do, um, we incorporated a surrogate. And with that surrogate partner, they would do a lot of the behavioral, whether it was uh, you know, t- touch, massage, kind of anxiety reduction, to get him out of his nervous self. And then we would work, you know, process it in session, and we'd go back and forth. One session with the surrogate, one session with myself. Um, and within about two months, he went from ejaculating his pants when a woman touched his leg, you know, wow. but not even getting the pants off, to having literally an oral sex session with the surrogate that was about 45 minutes. You know, they were doing, like, these peaking exercises. Uh, Stop, an, sorry. an hour-long sexual session. I mean, he really, it was wonderful. How old is he now? He's about 22. Okay. He was in, uh, in, at a college here in, the, uh, in Los Angeles. And what I find is that, you know, there's only so much we can do with talk therapy, and to have this behavioral experiential I always process, behavioral therapy, yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing. Uh, to work in conjunction, was, I found to be so powerful. So I... I, I would you be there with it? So it was like he'd have a session with... You I wouldn't, wouldn't be, be in the room. I wouldn't be in the room with them. They, they do their thing. They report back to me, both of them. <laughs> But, right. uh, but it's a really powerful thing because a lot of men, especially single men, if they want to work on their sexual concerns, sometimes we need someone to be sexual with. Right. And who is that person? Who I don't have all these issues attached with and I don't have the anxiety issue yeah. like me. that you, It's like not an emotional thing, but it's more you, an educational thing. You can't thing pick up a person at a bar and say, well, I'd like to do some start-stop <laughs> exercises. And, Come back to my place for a drink and some stuff. Start can, method. You can take some long massage to reduce my anxiety. Right, exactly. Um, but with a professional, you can talk about that. So there's a, there's a space, and, and he's excited and eager. And I think he's, you know, about to be set free and out in the wild. And you know, that's great. You must feel good about that. Another man, minute man, off, yeah. the, off the market. Yeah. Um, and and for, for people with early ejaculation, we're talking anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. So about a quarter to a third of men uh, experience this from their 20s all the way up into their 50s. Yeah, it and doesn't 60s. change. That's the thing, unless you work on it. But some, I mean, having you work with clients where not no, no failure to you, but that they just. There's other factors going on. That they just it could be a biological it could be something physical with their bodies. It could be it is a lot of times psychological, but there's so many different You know, I I almost always send my my clients to a a urologist out here to get a a, a physiological workup to make sure there's not any hormone uh, uh, issues that are going on, any vascular issues and whatnot. 
But then when I, when I look at the psychology pieces, a lot of times for guys it's about breakups. It's about first experiences, about being nervous, and these repetitive sort of negative uh, feedback loops they get into in their minds where they're replaying these bad experiences. Yeah, they're like about to have sex, and they're thinking, oh, this is going to be disaster. And they give up before right. they even start. Well, we actually exactly. all do that in different areas of our life, right? It's like the, the self-fulfilling prophecy that where it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad, exactly. and you don't even realize you're doing it. And I find with women, um, they're also in their heads. You know, a lot of times for women it's difficult for them to let go, for them to just allow their bodies right. to experience the pleasure and sort of succumb to the moment. How do you teach women? So you must hear from a lot of your from women, your, your, your patients as well as students that they've never had an orgasm. Mm-hmm. That's common. Very common. And obviously, I mean, we both know, you tell them, masturbate, figure out your own body. But what if still, have you had women that were just like a really big challenge that were having a hard time? Can you tell you about like a certain time maybe sure. where they finally overcome it? But there was, I mean, because it's not going to work for everybody right away. They're like, oh, yeah, go with the clitoris for an hour and you're going to have mind-blowing orgasms. It's a process. And, it might, and I think a lot of women give up. Mm-hmm. Or they think it just, I tried it. Yeah, I did that once. I masturbated for three days. It didn't work. I, you know, I'm like, did you buy a toy? And you did this? And you, you know, no, no, I just tried. You know, and they get, so what, what, what would happen? Well, I think, I think the mind, you know, because the brain is our, our uh, largest and sometimes most unused sex organ, I really do feel that, that we have to look at what's psychologically creating barriers and obstacles for us. So for a lot of women, they're worried about body image. They're worried about uh, uh, what their partner is thinking in that moment. They're worried about if they're going to let and He's thinking, oh, my God, I hope I don't ejaculate all over you right yet. Right. <laughs> right. He's not thinking about your, your two pounds that you think that you gained in your ass. Right. Right? Women, I mean, we all have our insecurities, men, too. And she's not looking at your penis going, oh, wow, that, exactly. that, that's so bummed and out. And sometimes the guy's like, oh, cool, she gained two pounds in her ass. There's more you know, junk in the trunk. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're all in our heads during sex. We're not always on the same page. page. Right, exactly. They were all in our, a lot of people are in their heads, and that's really what is destroying yeah. what could otherwise be a very fulfilling sex life. I find that uh, breathing exercises, some meditations, just slowing things down can really uh, uh, challenge and change our affect regulation in our bodies to make us more calmer and challenge that anxiety. You know, I, I tell clients, um, have you ever seen, you know, seen a Buddhist monk? And they'll say, yeah. What is their experience of, of, of what do you think of that with Buddhist monks? And they say, well, they're always kind of mellow and they meditate a lot. And I said, do you think that a Buddhist monk would be anxious in bed? I mean, don't you think they'd come in there with like a lot of calmness, a surreal kind of experience? And can you be that person? And, and oftentimes I see with breathing exercises and, and whatnot, um, a lot of meditative breathing components. Um, that stuff just calms people down. In, in every area of your life. Yeah. Uh, meditation, even if it's 10 minutes a day, start with that, mm-hmm. slowing down, breathing, because we just don't now with our cell phones and the, the light. Oh, there's, just, there's just no time that we're ever quiet. Right. At home, we're on our phones, we're on our television, and it just, it helps. Just, I mean, I've learned, I mean, you know how bad I need, I need it. Um, <laughs> but I've always, you know, I've always tried to incorporate it in yeah. some way. Into my life. And I'll have clients say, or students even too, like, I did it in traffic. I did my kegels and my breathing in traffic. And I said, well, the kegels are okay in traffic, but, you know, can you really kind of calm your mind and breathe and close your eyes in traffic, you know? Do my iPhone app, Kegel Count. There you go. Right. Yeah, right. I actually yeah. recommend that to the two, uh, my students. You do? Yeah, Good. No, it, it's awesome just because let's talk about kegel exercises because it's, I've actually had heard from more. It's for men and for women, but a lot of men, I mean, a lot of women, they just are like, oh, the doctors always tell you, oh, you know, do your kegels. You can do it with a traffic light. You can do it when you're waiting in line. And you're like, I'm not going to remember. So it has a, my, my app has a daily reminder that pops up. Time for I just did weird in the show. 11 days. Time for kegel camp. I was like, well, no time right now. I'll do them after. But it's good because it, no one remembers. Right. And my voice, like, walks you through it. But still, like, they, you're right. You should be home. You should be breathing. You should be, you know, but if you can only do it in your car, that's cool too. But they do help. It can help with all these things that we're talking about. Have women have stronger orgasms, help men. The same thing with the, the occurs with women, typically occurs with men. I mean, obviously it'll help with like the anal and the urinary incontinence, but it also will help with things like stronger, more powerful orgasms. Um, also being able to last longer, uh, strengthening your erection because you're, you're strengthening the, the ligaments and the vascular muscle all around the penis. I mean, this is all something... I know, and it's that, like free. You can just do it. You don't have to buy anything or anything. Just do your freaking candles, people. And it's I, important. I, I have people go to their doctors and say, my doctor never recommended this. They wanted me to, to get on this medication to destroy incontinence. And say, no, or what no, no. about medication for, for premature ejaculation? Right, right. Speaking of which, okay, big shout out. We have to give a shout out to our sponsors right now who support the show. So thanks everyone for listening because um, they support our sponsors, you know, helps keep the show free. I'm not going to charge you and just keep giving you great sex advice. So Promescent is um, is something that we're talking about for, for premature ejaculation. It's the only FDA-approved treatment, but it's not only for men um, who suffer from, like, typical, pre- which is defined as, I guess, and you, I always say it's before you want to have ejaculation, but also if you just want to last longer, it's the quickly absorbing delay spray. allows you to have the sex you want. You know about it. You mm-hmm. promescent. And we talked about, you and I 
talked about this, that it really is, it really has helped, you know, a lot of men, thousands of urologists have recommended promescent, again, as the only FDA-approved treatment for premature ejaculation. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great uh, addition to Instead anybody. Instead of, like, SSRIs and your presence, where it's like you're going to have all these side effects, you're going to take a pill every day of your life, so it can delay your ejaculation, but then you have all the other side effects of taking right. a pill, where this is like a short-acting thing that can, can actually help you. So that's promescent.com, P-R-O-M-E-S-E-N-T. Yeah, love it. Okay, one more shout-out. Talk about sex toys, good vibrations. You know how I love my, my toys. Um, good vibrations, goodvibes.com. They uh, carry all the best sex toy brands. You can get anything you want there. If you go to sexwithelmy.com and you actually click on the Good Vibes banner, I have my store there. You can see all my favorite toys. Um, I'm obsessed with the new... Um, uh, what's it called? The this bullet from WeVibe, the Tenga. Have you seen it? I have. Friggin' powerful. Yeah. Oh, I think there's the hustler stories of the craziness. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay, and then um, you can get the um, the magic wand, which is the uh, most powerful vibrator of all time. The Vibratex. I love the the new Vibratex rabbit. If you have your old rabbit from ten years ago, you should probably throw it away. They've updated it. Check it all out. Go to uh, sexalmy.com. Click on the good vibra- good vibrations pan- uh, banner, and use coupon code GVEmily20. Anyway, so, do you use toys? I do. Lots of them. Yeah? Um, like what? For, for, for partners or for myself as well, I want to hear about all of it. Uh, all of it. Um, this may seem a little strange to some people, but I think it's just being prepared. I'll have, like, a, a literally drawers full of new toys that if anybody wants to use them, we can just break them out and, you know, pop in a bag. Anybody? Like, just stop by? Like, hey. Uh, well, anybody. You know. chips and dip and <laughs> go into there's my goodie drawer. There's a bowl on my uh, living room table filled with toys. Just take one. <laughs> in my office. Have you been to my office? It's like a... It's crazy. Toys everywhere. We're like, whoa. Oh, we have like this like Bible group next to my office. That they love us. They could use those toys, huh? Probably. You know, yeah. I, I find with the toys, uh, um, everyone's got their own different, you know, desires and what they like. But you know, something that vibrates, just a small bullet, can be great for the, for a man, for testes, for you yeah. know, playing with the penis, just putting it on the frenulum or the head of the penis, and or even on the anus. And so there's on the uh, external portion. So. You know, we can use, we can just kind of borrow toys for both men and women. I know. I, I would say vibrations are not just for women. Yeah. Like, guys are like, because I think guys are, are pleasantly surprised that, oh, this actually feels really good. You know, putting a vibrator underneath, uh, let's say, a partner's chin and then they're performing fellatio on you is a fantastic feeling. And, you know, there's there's all these variations like, right. you can do. And men can do it, too, when they're putting their tongue next to their mouth and they're when, Exactly. When they're going down on a, on, on a vulva, you know. A flashlight, great toy as well too. It can both be fun and pleasurable. There's the vibro that can vibrate and uh, uh, actually adds even more stimulation. So that could be fun. Yeah. Um, the prostate toys, I think Enaros is the best uh, on the market. So those are fun as well. Um, and even just you know some of the stuff on the more kinky side. You know, bringing in uh, uh, something to just I find like not everybody is into let's say like you know hardcore BDSM and bondage, but just getting a nice scarf or a tie yeah. and tying up a partner very gently can be so powerful and easy to do. It's, it's a great, exactly. I love bondage tape. Quick bondage. Yeah. Do you know bondage tape? Yeah. I'm obsessed with it. Like, it looks like an electric, a roll of, like, masking tape or electrical tape, basically, and it's just, like, plastic. You rip it off. You just yeah. have it in my, in my bed. I have a straight too, on my bed, but besides that, <laughs> I also have the like, bondage tape, because you can, like, travel with it, and you just rip it. It's reusable, and you just, right. like, tear it, and you can tie th- anything up. You can wear it as clothing, too. Un- under like, the- you get a burning man, cross your breasts, <laughs> whatever. Underneath my mattress, um, I have a, the, a sports sheets, um, bed bondage. That's what I have so, too. So you can pull it out if, if need be. My housekeeper loves it. So she comes in she's like, can you mom? So like all the things are all straight. I'm like, I meant to keep them underneath there. Yeah. She leaves them out. There's some really perks nice. to the job. <laughs> Lots of perks. So I need a new home because it's filled with um, sex toys. But do you recommend that to, to, to students and your patients? Like kind of if they can or like, toys and all different things? All the time. You know, because a lot of them have insecurities about toys, they think that, uh, you know, the, the, the vibrator is going to take away my right. you know, sexual prowess. And I, I tell them, look, if you use a sex toy, it's going to be an extension of you. And when she goes off to talk to her friends about, you know, how great the sex was and she had orgasms because of that vibration or vibrator on her clitoris, she's not going to tell her friends, my God, my vibrator gave me the best. I know. Best. And then we cuddle. No, he can't cuddle. The vibrator you're, you're can't cuddle, say, right? My partner, my boyfriend was so great in bed. We had such a good time. And so you're going to get credit for this toy. It's an extension of you. And exactly. that's what I try to teach them. It's your new best and, friend. And Cuts it, on your time in half, too. I don't know. There's such a right, in you know, why are we so against using technology for sexual pleasure when we use a car to get to work? We, right. you know, we use a plane I mean, I think to fly. it is changing, but there's still, I mean, 
I like to think it's changing because, you know, that study came out in New York Times a few years ago that was like, more than 50% of all women have owned a vibrator. And half those, they yeah. use it with their, 80% of those use it with their, their partners. And But then I still, every, in day-to-day life, run into people are like, oh, God, no, I've never done that. I've never used a vibrator. No, I would never. Women, yeah. that's freaky. Like, yeah. People are like that's friends of mine. I'm like, how are we friends? And you think that like a vibrator is gonna really like take over? She's gonna be addicted to it, like it's some heroin drug or something. Like, yeah. Freaking <laughs> vibrator, get over it. Addicted to it. Um, yeah. Okay. So what? Okay. I want to talk, and we gotta move on to our next guest, Dr. Ava Cadell, which I know you guys work closely together, mm-hmm. as well as at, on some exciting things that you guys are. Ava can tell us a little bit about your your new series coming up. But um, I wanted to say, and I know you also write for Esmen. So tell me, you were talking about earlier, like your most popular article you wrote that like went crazy on there. What was uh, that? I'd say Just it was tough a, questions. Actually, or? it was either the Premature ejaculation article or the performance anxiety. Those are like top five on Google. Which are related. And they're related. They're intertwined with each other. Um, it, it seems like that's one of the, the biggest concerns that men have. I found that the performance anxiety uh, fuels the erection concerns, the early ejaculation right. concerns. So I think if we just work a lot more on our communication, our internal anxieties, get more sexual comfort, of course more sex education, um, we'd be a lot better off and there'd be, I think, less of a need for a sex therapist. I want to be out of town. <laughs> Dude, like, you just don't say that. I think people need sex therapy before they even need some of those other kinds of therapy. I mean, I think they need both. I think you got to work out your childhood stuff. But then, what you do that? No, I think for a lot of individuals and couples, if they'll be in therapy for 20 years, they'll never talk about, you know, their sex life and they don't know what else to go to. So, I think they should check you out. It's, it's drhernandochavez.com? Yes. And this will also be on, if you want to spell it out. I mean, is that people want to spell it? Sure, it's right. D-R-H-E-R-N-A-N. <laughs> D O C H A V E S dot com. Okay. And this will also be on sexwithemily.com. And what about uh, do you Twitter, Facebook, anything you'd like to uh, people to find you? Twitter and Instagram is Hernando underscore Chavez. Okay, got it. Love you, Hernando. Thanks uh, for being here. I'm so glad we finally did it. Thank we finally you for did me. it. Finally. We finally had sex together with Emily. On the Whatever radio, it is. In front of an audience. I love it. Okay, <laughs> thanks, honey. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll um, bring up Dr. Ava Goodell. Okay. So excited. Such a great day. Dr. Ava Goodell is amazing. I've met her actually through uh, Dr. Chavez here. Um, Ava Goodell is a loveologist. What is a loveologist? We're going to find out exactly. She's also writing for Penthouse now. And she, let's see, where is Ava Goodell? Clinical sexologist, sex counselor, hypnotherapist, loveologyuniversity.com, president of the American College of Sexologists, international media therapist, um, she's been on a ton of television shows. She's beautiful. She's amazing. She's the only other woman wearing five-inch heels at the conference. I love her. You might want to sit over here with the, the mic. And um, I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank Hello. you, Emily. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Yeah, you're doing Catalyst Con so far. You're, you're, in, you're involved with the conference as well, right? I am. I'm actually sponsoring it through the American College of Sexologists International. So it's an uh, international recognition organization of people like you, people in the field who are helping, you know, sexual health, sex toys, sex educators. So, yeah, we're recognizing and validating people who bring education and fun and entertainment. I love it. Okay, yeah, yeah it's great. I, mean, I just got here and I'm talking to you. I haven't even been out there yet, but I know a lot of the people here, it's going to be a great week. And the next week I'm going to the... Um, International Laundry Show in Las Vegas. If you are so used to going to conferences, like, no, this one's actually edgy. Next week you'll be seeing all the pictures of sex toys. Now you're going to be uh, talking to the, to, to the real people here today so that are actually changing lives and making big inroads in the fields of sex and, and sexuality. So how did you get involved? In people always ask me that, but I love asking you, like, how did you get into this crazy sex world, Dr. Eva Cadell? Well, mine came from adversity. I was actually um, raised by nuns. It's oh. not a joke, yes. And... Uh, they taught me that sex was dirty and that touching yourself was a mortal sin. And they said that if I ever kissed a boy, a baby would pop out of my mouth. They so, really did. And this was yeah. just once. This was, like, repeated. Yeah, I mean, they were so you screwed You didn't have to hear something like that once. But it's so sad yeah. because no doubt they were taught that. And they were really messed up. Right. But the problem is that I grew up a very confused teenager. I had really horrible relationships. I didn't know the difference between love and sex. So I think it was my destiny to become a sexologist. And so I have the most pleasure out of mentoring students, teaching sexology. You know, I have my Loveology University. Which I is love love it. Yeah, so people can just sign up. So it's yeah. a doctor. So it's Ava, A-V-A, Cadell, C-A-D-E-L-L.com. 
Right, right. And it, it, so tell me about Love Allergy University. Well, it's my... I want to go. It's just my wealth of information that I want to share with the world because I think everybody should know positive information about love, romance, relationships, and sex. And so it's sort of... My so it's, does it start with... Um, how does it start, the course, for example? Well, there's a program where you can actually get certified as a love coach. That's the ultimate program. But then there are little courses on oral sex, anal sex... Group sex. And they're, and video, right, and they're videos and, and, and they're videos? They're slideshows, they're videos, they're e-books. It's a combination of all kinds of, you know, learning technology. That is, is uh, a very smart, because I think a lot yeah. of people definitely need that, that, that kind of help. <laughs> around all those areas. So, and also, tell me about Penthouse now. You just, you're right, you're the writing at Penthouse, writing a column? You're still writing yeah, stuff. so I have a column. It's called Sex Academy, but I also have created courses for them. Oh, nice. And videos. And Dr. Hernando Chavez is my co-host. I chose him as my co-host right. for the videos. Right, a good-looking couple. I mean, he's, working relationship couple. Well, he's, you know, he's really qualified. He's an MFT, he's a professor, he's a therapist, and I wanted so, I wanted a young, cool, hot guy who knows his stuff. Should we say his, uh, his email again in case any people are listening? <laughs> and he's single. He is right? single. <laughs> Adorable. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, we are having <laughs> We're get so you much... Date. Keep going. Not that you need our help. Turn yeah. up, yeah. But we're having so much fun, again, educating and entertaining people who want to be great lovers, who want to have more confidence, and who want to do something new and exciting. Like, I bet you didn't know that masturbation makes you smarter. No? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. It does. I hope so, because. <laughs> but I'll tell you how it grows. That's what I keep telling everyone. I can't go into, I'm not, I can't, today I'm just home masturbating and getting smarter. <laughs> but now you can see it grows my, it grows your brain cells. Absolutely. Especially if you masturbate with your non-prominent hand. And if you do it in a different position, in a different place, at a different time. Every time? You mean like, not every time, but you switch, time. switch up your routine. Exactly. Then your brain has to think differently. It's not just a pattern. So there are, and even having sex in a different position with your partner grows your brain cells. You get into ruts when you just have sex the same way over yeah, and over, over again. Predictability. Do you hear from a lot of couples that are just, you know, trying to help couples who, I mean, I think yeah, I mean, the penthouse series is... Helping couples who kind of want to expand and get out of their, their sexual ruts. Which Absolutely. Which happens, it does. And it's so funny because I feel like every day I hear from people, it's like they wake up and it's like they just found out like the world isn't flat. Like they're the first one. They're like, oh my God. It's so weird. We, we were having amazing sex and then we moved in together. These people are already married. We moved in together and now we've been living together. We just haven't had sex. Like, I don't know what happened. You know, it's like, okay, this is what happened. You know, it's like, people freak out. It's like, no, this is, and they just need tools like that to just understand that it's normal, that you have to have a conversation about it. I always say communication is a lubrication. Talk about well, it and mix good. it up. That's good. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, it's it. very good. Oh, okay. totally. <laughs> um, but so, so there's some more educational, informal, and fun, and you guys are great to look at too, and you give good information on. Thank so, you. so it's very rewarding. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I mean, because I just, I just, we were talking about earlier. People just don't, they really don't know where to go for this information. Right. We're There's just not, making it more accessible. And, and can I go back to your, your, your being raised by nuns? Because I want to yeah. go back to that because there is so much about religion and sex. That when we talk about sexual performance issues or anxiety that people have, a lot of it has to do with not just because they had a bad experience once, but upbringing and yeah. the messages that we get as children. It's devastating. Whether it's religion or it's our parents or whatever it is. And how do you work with people? Because you had to get through that. So I did. Well, I'm also an ASEC certified sex counselor. Yeah, so you've got like every degree in so the world I here, right? Women. So you can like help so, anyone. <laughs> like this, this, this. But a lot of women will, will come to see me who've never had an orgasm. And some of them have been, you know, programmed by religion to feel guilty and ashamed. Right. How do you and help so, them? Well, I tell them that if God didn't want them to have an orgasm, she would not have given them a clitoris. Right. With 8,000 of it. Exactly. Right. And, and that does give them permission to touch themselves. And some women, of course, think that it's a man's job right. to give them an orgasm. And I say absolutely not. You know, it's your responsibility to have pleasure, to fantasize about whoever you want, even if it's Brad Pitt. It doesn't matter. Right, we don't because care. Because your partner is going to reap the benefits, and so are you. Right. So, you know, fantasy is a safe place. You don't have to reveal all of them. Right, and doesn't mean, mean that you want them to have one, happen. You know, like, you know, a lot of women want yeah. sex with Brad Pitt. They do want sex with Brad Pitt. That one they might want the sex with Brad Pitt. But whatever else crazy things yeah, you do yeah, or yeah. think about, and I'm creating no judgment, whatever you think about it doesn't mean 
you know, I think there's even shame about that because they've just yeah. completely shut down. Right. So the process of opening up these women who have never had orgasms were told that you know their eyebrows are going to fall out if they have sex or they're going to have a baby if they what was it? Kiss a boy. I mean, really. I mean, and Crazy. I know that 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 you know a guy I dated early on was raised in, in a really religious home and he was always told that yeah you know if you had sex with she's going to get pregnant if you masturbate she should even give her. I mean, just the craziest things. And he still not that he believed it, but he still had some. There were some issues, I mean, it's so sad that they have this control over your sexuality when it's our, well, it's our second basic instinct after survival. And so if you try to repress that instinct, really bad things can happen to you. Right. And you can take them out, you know, in, it can manifest in, in violence and just all kinds of negative. Right, and you've been through it. So I'm just wondering, like, how you, like, what was your turning point? We kind of skipped that, but, like, when you realize, like, no, this, this isn't right where I was brought up, like, that this messaging wasn't right, and how did you personally, was it, did you have a, a partner, or did you I have education? Or? I, I had nothing, I had no mentors, I had no family, because I was an author, so it was really hard, for me, I had to hit rock bottom, and sort of not even want to live anymore, and then, and then just pick myself up and say, okay, I have to educate myself, I just have to take responsibility for my own mental health. Right. The most and, important thing uh, we can do. And so that's why I love helping other people to reach success and overcome their obstacles because I didn't have that. Right. So that's great. Well, you're doing you're doing great work. Thank you. So what would you say are the um, most common questions that, that you, you get asked? Or the most people that you work with or you know like look. So most of you're doing your your, your Laval University, which is an online course. That's online. I do see people in private practice. You do? And I write okay. books and I travel around the world lecturing to Forbes 500. Companies, and that's my favorite thing. I to love Fortune 500 companies? Yeah. About sex. About sex. Okay, you know I love this. I am going to come with you and carry your luggage. <laughs> so tell well, me. Last year we went to five cities in India, five cities in Australia. Next year I'm going to Africa uh, during Valentine's to do a retreat. To what the, are you talking to these Fortune? Are you like, you know, don't bang your secretary in, in, in the conference room? Oh, that's so Not cute. a good idea. I don't do that because their wives are there. No. So, right. But they're so busy making money that their relationships falter. Right. So right now, my biggest, most successful presentation is based on my new book. It's called Neurolovology. Neurolovology. So it's how to grow your brain cells, expand your sexuality, and grow your relationship together rather than apart. Is it like based on like neuro, like changing your, your neuro-linguistic program or changing your, your, your thoughts that you are associating with? With sex or with some of it? I mean, yeah, it's neuro, it's neurology, oh, neurology sexology. Right, sexology yeah, it's, neurology. it's combining the two. I'll give you my book. Oh, you just give me your yes, book, okay? Yes, so you've yes. written a lot of books. I have, right. but this is my favorite one. My okay, best and where one. can people find it? They can go to Amazon.com, and it's endorsed by Dr. John Gray, nice. who wrote Men from Mars. Men from Mars, yeah. yeah, amazing. So it must be good, right? It must, yeah, it must <laughs> be good. You wouldn't just endorse that, right? Yeah. Um, but basically, I give people unique yeah, exercises. About, yeah, so give me an example. To connect. So, I mean, there are some really cool exercises where they look into each other's eyes and they ask if they can look into each other's soul and they tell each other what they see. So there's a lot of communication that they've never done before. And then we do also sensory um, exercises where we, they blindfold each other. And, like, I'll tell the woman, you know, to be... I'll tell the man to blindfold the woman and then to touch her, to touch her arm or her hand and ask her how she wants to be touched. Because right. most men touch women the way they want women to touch exactly. them. Exactly. It's like and totally reverse. Right. So again, that opens up communication, erotic communication. And then we do so feeding like a each sexual other. therapy book for couples to do together. Right. Like once a week, honey, we're going to sit down and read chapter. Is that kind of how it is? Yeah, there's people are so busy. Yeah, hundred exercises it's in my great. book. It's so useful. It'll take one, yeah. I mean, because sometimes maybe it's overwhelming or if they don't have time to go... See a therapist because mm -hmm. you know they can do it at home and they can be like, "This is our night. This is when we're going to do one of these exercises, right. or one a week, or one a month, even." When, I mean, think about it. Who's in one? You know, because often we, both of you, are people who have gone years. We've had sex in years, and we've never talked about it. But if they just did one thing differently, I would say do one thing different this month and this week. You know, you never want to be like every day. Do yeah. one thing differently because that's just what are you saying? Failure. What's the most common question? The most common question is how do we keep that in love feeling, yes. that passionate feeling, that chemistry alive? It is an and it question. is. Variety. Right now, I think on my website, I have a special ebook on 52 sizzling weeks of sex. And I say, take the sex weekly challenge. 
So once a week you do something totally different. Like what? What's what? What would be one of those things? Well, I mean, one of those things could just be, you know, um, a nipple orgasm. Have yeah. a nipple orgasm. A lot of people don't know how to do it. Yeah. But so I give you instructions. Can everyone have a nipple orgasm? Yes, everyone can have oh, any kind of orgasm if you think it. You can do it. So conceive it, believe it, do and you will achieve it. Because I always say it's like the most common type of orgasm. Like I've never had one. I've never had one. So you walk them through it. So can you? Can you? But what's your? How would you walk someone through having their first nipple orgasm? Are they giving it to themselves or their partners? Well, it's nice if someone else gives it to you. Totally. But you could give it's it like to yourself. Scratching your own back. Yeah, but I mean, you could do it. So you want to start out away from the nipple first and just you know stimulate the breast. Preferably with a tongue. Let's face it, a tongue is nicer, yeah. more sensual. It's wet and warm than a finger, right? Right. But then when you get my close, nipples just got really excited about I that. I can see that. Yeah, I know. So, oh yeah, I like I it. You I gotta have, go. You should have a nipple orgasm on the radio. That'd be you great. know, people have been asking for orgasms on the radio forever. I'm like, that is not the image I'm looking for. <laughs> okay. You're like, you're so sexy, Emily. There's nothing about you. Never talk about your own sex life. Why aren't you having sex with anyone on the air? So, uh, maybe, I, maybe, you know, it's, it's on the list. It's on the list, there you go. If I need more ratings, eventually I'll just, you know, have a carnival yeah. come on and give me a nipple orgasm. Good idea. So she does want me to give her a Oh, no, I would love you to, actually. <laughs> I was going to say that. I feel so rejected, Emily. No, I, how about both? I okay. actually initially thought the three of us would be talking. Else. No, we could take a nipple each. No, I actually, <laughs> you're so sad. Like, I, I actually was thinking about you, but I brought in Hernando. I thought that the way you were talking about it was very sexy. So, anyway, oh, so you so go around the nipple. So you go, don't so go, take the clitoris. Don't go right for the clitoris. Exactly, don't go right for the nipple. Exactly, exactly. So you work your way there, um, caressing with, as I said, the tongue. Even use your hair on the breast. Hair is very sensual. Right. And use your breath. You can use your warm breath and your cool breath around the nipple. And if you have ice, ice can be really sexy as well, or a feather, or a sex toy. So just Vibration. Yeah, so 10 minutes of nipple foreplay. Then get your fingers wet with some great lube. And then this is so underrated. Oh. I just I don't know why there's no lube on every goddamn nightstand in America. That's my goal, actually. I like that goal, yeah. Every nightstand, just be proud to put your lube there. It makes everything, you know, better. People think, oh, dry, discomfort. Anyway, okay, so no, lube is a nipple orgasm. Yeah, lube is silky, yeah, sexy. So, so put lube on your fingers and then start dialing the nipple as if you were dialing a radio. So you dial. Not too hard. No, no, gently. Always I always tell men go five times slower than you think you should be going at this moment. That's good. That's very good. So in slow motion. So you dial it to the right at least 20 times. Then you dial it to the left. And then you start squeezing. Sorry, did you start to hear Howard Stern or something on satellite? <laughs> no, I hope not. Okay. Then you start squeezing it between your thumb and your two fingers. So you pull it up gently. But again, well, she can see how beautiful she looks showing this right here. This is how, how you have picture. a nipple orgasm. Yeah, I love gently. it. Okay. And then you lick it. So you pull and lick, pull and lick. And in fact, pretend you're licking a clitoris because it's very similar. It's similar, right? isn't it? And you'll feel the nipple getting erect. You'll feel the nipple growing. And so then you're going to be caressing and pulling and licking. So it's a little bit of multitasking. Right. But also what I suggest is with the other hand, you can either stimulate the vulva or you can actually move your hand around near the heart and have a heart connection while you're creating a nipple orgasm. This. So it just depends what your intention is. Is it just to arouse or is it to create more intimacy? You can do either or you can do both. Right. This is a, so, that's a great, I mean, people are always asking about the nipple orgasm. Mm -hmm. I love and then, it. it and, then like you end up, and then you start sucking with your lips. Not your teeth, but sucking. No teeth, right. No teeth. Although some people like the to be nipple. nipple. Yeah, but don't, yeah. don't start with the teeth, yeah. ever, I mean, with anything, even with the penis. Yeah, oh, yeah. But if right? a partner says, bite me, hey, then go right, for it. Right, if he says, bite me, what are you going to do? <laughs> you got to bite, you got to bite. Okay, so we have got, we have to wrap up, but I, I would love you to come back on the show because there's a million other things we can talk about. Um, but what else we covered? They should get your new book. They should check out Loveology University, but it's all at avapindell.com. Yeah. And then the Sex Academy is at sexacademy.com. Sexacademy.com, yes. and then Twitter, Facebook. Social media? Just no. Dr. Ava, yes. Someone Dr. Ava's all there. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
And good luck to you with your new your new penthouse video Thank series you. and everything. And we're, I'd love to have you back on the show. And some great Thank you. Here. It's been so fun having sex with you. I know. Thank yes. you. Yeah, just wait until the net nipple orgasm. So anyway, everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Also, you can check me out at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's all sex with Emily. On Wednesday, I do free chats on uh, Instagram. So I answer all your questions. 12.30 to 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. It's uh, at Sex Family. Ask me your questions. I will answer them in 140 characters or less. I actually prefer. I'm kind of just worried about the answer right there. I love it. So uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to Sex with Emily. Was it good for you? Okay. Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Morse from sexwithemily.com. Do you want to last longer in bed? Permesin is the only FDA-approved treatment for premature ejaculation. One in three men suffer from premature ejaculation, but they don't have to. Go to permesin.com to get the desensitizing spray that will allow you to have the sex you deserve.